welcome to cc we'll continue with our discussion on coleridge <clears throat> the previous session was dedicated completely to his style of writing poetry and one of his most significant poems the rhyme of the ancient mariner we now move on to his other poems that are versatile in nature and design his other important works are kubla khan cristobal dejection and ode fears in solitude and there is a long list of poems which he composed with different moods kubla khan was written by samuel taylor coleridge in the autumn of 1797 he had fallen ill and had taken opium to get some relief from pain along with the relief he had an unintentional poetic vision and the poem is the result of that unintentional poetic vision which is unique in style and composition it is considered as the greatest example of romantic poetry as it is full of imagination deep personal experience and love for nature kubla khan is one of the masterpieces of supernatural poetry he does so by describing the pleasure dome and surrounding area where it is constructed the opening lines of the poem are very suggestive in zanadu kubla khan orders a stately palace to be built where alf the sacred river ran though caverns measureless to man and sunless sea create a feeling of mystery and fear in the minds of the reader there is something very suggestively vague in the very magnificence of the surrounding area there is a deep romantic gorge which lay across the woods of cedar trees from this very gorge a mighty mountain is pushed out momentarily which becomes the source of the river alf the water of the spring gushes forth with a great speed and huge pieces of rocks are thrown out with it and get scattered here and there this description of the pleasure dome and its surrounding area closes down with the suggestion it was a miracle of rare device a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice and while describing a savage place he gives a, gives it a total supernatural garb by saying oh, a savage place as holy and enchanted as ever beneath a vanning moon was haunted by woman wailing for a demon lover the expressions a savage place a vanning woman a demon lover are noteworthy the following lines add to the weirdness of the place and arouse in our hearts a feeling of fear and subdued horror and amid this tumult tumult kubla khan heard from far ancestral voices prophesying war in the tumult created by the falling of the river into the lifeless ocean kubla khan hears the voices of his ancestors foretelling him about the impending war he revives within him the symphony and song of the abyssinian maid whom he had seen once in a dream he seems to be extremely delighted and thinks of building the pleasure dome in the air along with the loud music see the imagination of building the pleasure dome in air with loud music the expressions used by the poet such as weave a circle round him thrice holy dread and milk of paradise suggest that there is something definitely supernatural and abnormal about the poet coleridge had a definite aim in mind in writing poems with supernatural element and that was to create a willing suspension of disbelief in the minds of the reader which constitutes the poetic faith he tried successfully to achieve his aim by his faithful adherence to the truth of nature and also by introducing the supernatural element blended in it in kubla khan the vivid description of the chasm and the mighty mountain is indeed very romantic but the comparison of the falling and scattering pieces of huge rocks with that of the rebounding hail and all the shafi grain beneath the thresher's flail 
is very natural and is drawn from everyday life. If the treatment to these mundane things that Coleridge gives them, then it looks supernatural and at the same time believable. The unbelievable things become believable. That is the quality of willing suspension of disbelief. Kubla Khan is a poem of pure romance. <clears throat> All the romantic associations can be seen concentrated in a small poem. It is full of sensuous phrases such as the bright garden, incense bearing trees laden with blossoms, sunny spots of greenery, etc. Then again, the description of the Abyssinian maid, which is purely romantic in character. A damsel with a dulcimer is a, in a vision once I saw. It was an Abyssinian maid. The closing lines of the poems are equally romantic, who seems to be inspired divinely. And all should cry, beware, beware, his flashing eyes, his floating hair. We find several references to distant land and far-off places in the poem, such as Xanadu, Elf, Mount Ebora. These imaginary yet real-looking names give the poems a truly romantic character. The images and expressions in the poems are supernatural in character and they successfully create an atmosphere which is full of mystery and awe. The first part of the poem is a dream, but in the second part, the poet makes an attempt to realize his vision and to give it a concrete form. Both the parts of the poem are closely connected with each other. The second part of the poem is a logical extension of the first. In the opinion of the poet, the second part describes the act of poetic creation and the deep pleasure of imaginative fulfillment. The power of poetic creativity is such that the poet is able to create a beautiful pleasure dome with all its romanticism and gorgeous surroundings in the air. The poem Kubla Khan has been universally appreciated for its haunting melody. There is a close correspondence between the meter, the march of the verse and the imagery throughout the poem. The full tone and slow movement of the lines are exquisite for their melodiousness and rhythm. Christabel is a long narrative ballad by Samuel Taylor Coleridge in two parts. The first part was reputedly written in 1797 and the second in 1800. Coleridge planned three additional parts, but these he never could complete. The story of Christabel concerns a central female character of the same name and her encounter with a stranger called Geraldine, who claims to have been abducted from her home by a band of rough men. <clears throat> Christabel goes into the woods to pray by the large oak tree where she hears a strange noise. Upon looking behind the tree, she finds Geraldine, who says that she had been abducted from her home by men on horseback. Christabel pities her and takes her home with her. However, supernatural signs, you get signals, a dog angrily moaning despite being asleep, fading flames on torches suddenly reigniting. Geraldine, she is denied, you know, to cross the iron gate. She is denied the prayer. They all seem to indicate that all is not well with Christabel. Christabel sees something that she finds simultaneously horrifying and undescribable as she watches Geraldine undresses in her room in the night. Christabel's father, Sir Leoline, is charmed both by Geraldine and by his memory of Geraldine's father, his estranged childhood friend. Christabel's attempt to warn her father are silenced by Geraldine's spell and Sir Leoline and Geraldine leave Christabel alone and disgraced. The heart of this poem is the scene in Christabel's bedchamber. The two women enter the room in darkness and Christabel lights a lamp that is chained to a carved angle's feet at which point Geraldine collapses. 
her, which is her apparent weakness to Christina, Christabel, Christian symbols and to light hint that she is not as virtuous as she claims to be. After she is revived by wine, see she is not revived by water, she is revived by wine because she is an evil spirit. Geraldine seems to speak to Christabel's mother's guardian spirit, telling it, this hour is mine, an action that once again suggests that her intentions are malevolent and also connects her to the supernatural. She seems something on Geraldine's bosom and half a side, but the speaker is unable to fully describe the sight, saying only that it is a sight to dream of, not to tell. Christabel, though she presumably sees whatever has so startled the speaker, is not given the chance to say anything as Geraldine immediately puts her into her arms and tell her that in touch of her bosom there worketh a spell. So, Christabel is immediately put into a spell, one that will make Christabel forget what she has seen until she only remembers rescuing a lovely lady in the wood. In other words, until she remembers nearly as much as the audience knows. Christabel is placed under the same spell as the speaker. Apparently, though both have seen the mark, neither can directly speak of or describe. Whatever it is, Christabel has seen though, it is horrible enough that Geraldine must immediately work magic to make her forget. The scene ends with Christabel in Geraldine's arm in bed, where Geraldine's the spell recaps the night's events, excluding whatever it was that Christabel saw. The spell ends with a description of Christabel, whose love and charity led her to rescue Geraldine and to shield her and shelter her from the damp air. At some level, Geraldine is praising Christabel here, though perhaps not an entirely sincerely. The line also means that the section ends with an image of safety and comfort and the conclusion to part the first compares to Geraldine's embrace to that of a mother with her child. Coleridge's Christabel provides the image of a gothic figure formed from the last holdings of pure romanticism. Her experience with Geraldine takes readers on a transformational and undeniably dark and eerie journey throughout the poem. Her inner transformation through the realization of Geraldine's evil can be paralleled with the recent historical fascination with the idea of the human fall and original sin that causes human imperfections. From the start, the readers are given an uneasy feeling of the grey and chilled atmosphere of the poem as it seems to differ drastically from the bright and cheerful character of Christabel we are presented with, seeming a naive beauty being the lovely lady Christabel whom her father loves so well. The image provides a sweet and dutiful daughter, but then just as quickly readers are given a turn of character. The image provides a sweet and dutiful daughter, but then just as quickly readers are given a turn of character. Dejection and Ode is another poem by Coleridge, which he wrote in 1802. It is it in its original form was written to Sarah Hutchinson, a woman who was not his wife and discusses his feelings of love for her. The poem expresses feelings of dejection and the inability to write the poetry or to enjoy nature. In this poem, uh, Ode to Dejection, Wordsworth is introduced because he is introduced as a counter and a contrast to Coleridge because he Wordsworth is unable to return turn such a mood into a benefit whereas Coleridge cannot. Coleridge cannot find anything positive in his problems and he expresses how he feels paralyzed by his emotions. This source of their paralysis was Coleridge's feeling for Hutchinson and problems dealing with his marriage. However, Coleridge couldn't have been completely in dejection, else he would not have been able to write this poem. The poem also captures some of his feelings, especially in analyzing a problematic childhood and an exploration of religion. 
Partly, these feelings were fueled by his inability to accept his opium addiction and other problems. When he wrote this poem, Coleridge was addicted to opium and he was unhappy in his marriage and he had fallen in love with Sarah Hutchinson. Intended originally as a letter in verse to Sarah, it describes his complaints and fears with great emotional intensity. The speaker is afraid that his poetic powers are waning and that he no longer responds intensely to nature as he used to. He reveals the disintegration of his marriage and the damaging effects of opium. At the time of birth, nature gave him great creative and imaginative powers, but his nature gave constant unhappiness. He destroyed those powers. The poet is painfully conscious of this law. He believes that imagination is the primary instrument of all spiritual and creativity powers. Therefore, when he has lost his imagination, he has lost his creativity, his potential gift, which what makes life worth living. The poem was originally addressed to Wordsworth, but later on it was changed and submitted to Sarah Hutchinson. The poet expresses an experience of double consciousness, his sense perceptions are vivid, but his inner state is faint, dull and miserable. He sees, but does not feel. There is a difference between seeing and feeling. Though he suffers, yet the pain dull and nothing from outside can impel him to activity. The sources of happiness and activity lie in the soul of man and not in the outward objects of nature. At the beginning of the poem, the poet is seen in a melancholy mood, watching the rising storm. He hopes that the rising storm might raise his spirits also, as it used to do in the past. The poet has lost this power of joy, and nothing in the world can restore this power to him. When he had this power in the past, even misfortunes had no sting for him. On the contrary, they supplied him the material for happiness, but the misfortunes and misery of life have totally crushed his spirit and bowed him down to earth. This, however, is not the saddest thing to the poet. The saddest thing for him is that he has lost the creative spirit of imagination forever. In this ode, we notice a great change in Coleridge's attitude towards nature. This is, he expresses his philosophy of nature in this poem, which is totally contradictory to his own earlier philosophy and also the nature creed of Wordsworth, his friend and fellow poet. Coleridge makes use of concrete imagery and comparison to describe the atmosphere and the state of his mind accurately and vividly. Describing the nature of the storm that is raging outside the poet says, that the more appropriate places for such times of storms are bare cock, a mountain lake, a high pine grove or a haunted house. The poet uses vigorous and forceful imagery to describe the sounds produced by the storm which are compared to the mad rushing of the defeated army with the groans and cries of trampled and wounded soldiers all around. He compares these sounds of the storm with the frightened screaming of a terrified child who has lost its way home and wandering in a lonely forest near its home. It differs from the 18th century ode and establishes a distinctively romantic ode in adapting the personal voice, meditative structure and private subject that Coleridge had developed in this conversational poem. He has used the poetic devices very wisely, the subtle and appropriate usage of alliteration can be witnessed throughout the poems. The feeling of strangeness and the unfamiliar, which is not so common, led to the romantic poets to introduce supernatural elements as a convenient device for achieving their objects. Of all the romantic poets, Coleridge has been able to produce real romances in his poetry. He succeeds in creating a semblance of reality by connecting the supernatural with the truth of human emotions. Romantic poetry is a synonym for the love for nature. In this respect, 
Coleridge is in no way inferior to Wordsworth, Shelley and Keats who were considered to be the high priests of nature at that point. The love for nature is evident in all the poems of Coleridge. His poetry of nature is characterized by subtle and minute observations as well as by broad and general effects. The poet uses various shapes, different objects, various colors of nature as his symbols to depict his mental and emotional states. A note of despair and melancholy was a general characteristic feature of the romantic writers. This characteristic trait led the poets of this era gave a personalized touch to their creations. This personal touch is very important as this is the reason why the poetry of this period allows the poet to pour his heart out and touches the heart of the reader. The undercurrent of pessimism can be traced in almost all the romantic poets and Coleridge is no exception. The personal touch, pessimism and a tone of melancholy is present throughout the poems of Coleridge. Many of the romantic poets were attracted towards the Middle Ages for its charm, magic and mystery. The romantic poets turned to this trait to have an escape from the sordid realities of their life. The Middle Ages also provided the refuge from the worries and anxieties of the contemporary world. Coleridge also turned to the Middle Ages for inspiration and was fascinated by its magic and mystery. He also turned to the Middle Ages for inspiration and was fascinated by its magic. The Romantic period was marked with a note of humanitarianism. They were attracted towards the French Revolution and supported it in its early stages. They did that because of its basic principles of liberty, equality and fraternity. The poetry of Coleridge is very much sensuous and pictorial. He deals with concrete images that are palpable to all the human senses. The pictorial quality helps greatly in enhancing the supernatural effect in his poetry. It is mainly impassioned. His success lies in making his poems appeal to our innermost feelings of pity, fear and love. Romantic poetry is characterized, characterized by the love of imagination. His imagination is undoubtedly very high. He wrote the entire poem Kubla Khan under the influence of the poem. The depth of his dream is explored by Coleridge and he is able to create a landscape which is impossible to exist in reality. The treatment of supernatural is important. His contribution to romantic poetry reached its apex through his treatment of the supernatural. He is a master poet of the supernatural. He attempts to draw the supernatural in a convincing way where the reader is compelled to take it for real or natural by willing suspension and willingly suspending the disbelief. <laughs> Sense of mystery in his poems are also very noteworthy. He displays painstaking mastery in creating some characters and events that evoke a sense of curiosity or suspense because of an unknown, obscure or enigmatic quality. Coleridge has the most imaginative mind amongst the romantic writers. He is essentially good at portraying vivid imagery. He has the power to transport the audience in his realm of imagination by convincing the reader to accept things which do not exist in reality at all. This is the very quality which enables Coleridge to incorporate convincingly, effectively incorporating the elements of mystery in his poems. For example, his description of Kubla Khan's palace forces the reader to believe in its existence. The major poems of Coleridge have a dreamlike quality. His poems were inspired by reveries. He saw them in his dreams and visualized in his poetry. The, the poetry when you read 
it appears that you are reading a dream. For instance, Kubla Khan, it is a super superb example of a dream. In this poem, he recounts a poetic form which we saw in a vision. Coleridge had a strong devotion to the spirit of medieval ages. Coleridge's love for the supernatural was engendered by the romance and legends of the Middle Ages. Medievalism provides him the opportunity to create the sense of remoteness and a mysterious setting. Coleridge's initial attitude towards nature was pantheistic. During this stage, he treated nature as a moral teacher. Later on, he changed his attitude towards nature. He believed that it depends on our mood and temperament how we would interpret nature. This mood is clearly deflected in dejection and ode. O lady, we receive, but what we give, and in our life alone doth nature live. Ours is her wedding garment, ours her shroud. He clearly says that nature reflects whatever happens and whatever we feel in our heart and mind. He has a mastery of a storyteller. This is probably the strongest part of his poetic potentials. He is aware of the fact that a successful storytelling involves a gripping suspense or continuous evocation of interest. Coleridge always cared for the well-being of humanity. His love for the humanity is revealed through his strong support for the French Revolution. He supported the upheaval, assuming that it would free the masses from the oppression of the dictators. With this, I conclude my discussion on S.T. Coleridge. Reference list is given for the students of Romantic Literature for their reference in future.